All right, and then with that, we will now transition to the SMP REACH presentations. So we will now transition to the campers from S2021 SMP REACH who have been working so hard on their university education projects after the CLAMP's conclusion, and they are here to share their projects with you all. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand it off to our first group of presenters who have been creating a children's book titled Arlo and Papa, a tale of embracing neurodiversity that teaches young readers about solidarity and combating stigmas against the neurodiverse community. Feel free to take it away. All right, hello and good evening, everybody. We're the neurodiversity writers, we're the authors of the book, Arlo and Papa, and we're super excited to be here today. We'll be talking to you all today about our book, what we've done over the past couple of months and where we'd like to take our project. So first, let's start off with some introductions. I'm Drew, and I'm an author of the book. I'm Christine, and I'm an illustrator. I'm Katie, and I'm a writer. I'm Audrey, and I am also a writer. Hi, I'm Tiana. I'm on the illustration team. I'm Isha, and I was on the writing team. I'm Arushi, and I'm an illustrator. Hi, I'm Rahul, and I'm, in write I'm a writer. Hi, I'm Caitlin. I'm an illustrator and writer. Hi, I'm Saisha. I'm an illustrator. This past summer, we all came together at SNP Reach, which, as Dr. Fung mentioned, is a program for high school students interested in neurodiversity advocacy. We were presented with a variety of different project options. We could pursue something like a website, do something like a podcast, or another format of the sort. But we all eventually decided to pursue the creation of a children's book. And once we decided on a children's book, we had a couple of other questions to answer. What type of project did we want to pursue? What format would it take? Would it be something like a poetry book? Would it be a typical children's book? Would it be the Choose Your Adventure book? We all eventually decided to choose a typical children's book. And now we'll pass it off to Arushi to talk a little bit more about what we've done over the past couple of months. So as neurodiversity advocates, we wanted to find our problem statement, which we would try to, um, as, as neurodiversity advocates, we wanted to help. And our problem statement was, as neurodivergent youth are not represented in the media, can struggle to speak up about accommodations, hear ableist slurs and prejudices, can undergo discrimination. We want to aid by destigmatizing the concept of neurodivergence in youth. Neurodivergent youth need more representation because it will normalize neurodiversity from a young age and also lessen the stigma. Neurotypical youth also need to become more aware of these prejudices in order to become better allies in the future. So after discussing, our solution was to create a children's book that teaches both neurotypical and neurodivergent youth about the importance of neurodiversity and the strength-based model in a, manner, in a manner suitable for children. So now I'll be talking a little bit more about what we've done since SMP Reach. So since the camp ended, we've made lots of progress with our book, Arlo and Papa, and we've also created plans for future children's books focused on neurodiversity. For Arlo and Papa, we've published our book on Amazon Kindle, and we are also working on implementing it in our own communities, such as through elementary schools, which we will talk about later. And we've also created a website and a social media page on Instagram. Next, I'll be passing on to Katie and Saisha, who will be talking more about the design thinking process. Okay, so we're going to be going through the design thinking process, which is empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. So for empathize, to just briefly go over what was said before, we recognize the need for more neurodivergent representation in the media. For define, we recognize that we needed to define the problem in order to reach a solution, so we created a problem statement, which was also mentioned previously. And for ideate, our solution was to create a children's book within a poem format. So now I'll be passing it on to Saisha, who will be talking about the prototype and test. Yeah, so we created our prototype, um, which was a book that follows Arlo, a neurodivergent girl with dyspraxia on her first day of school. And to finish this prototype, we divided into a writing team and an illustration team. And at the beginning of the presentation, we stated our goals that we did. 
and, um, and we collaborated to create the prototype. And to test our prototype during our time at SMP Reach, we tested our prototype by reading it aloud and showing the PDF of our book to other participants and we requested feedback. We also created a video of our group members reading the book aloud to make it accessible to all students. We've shared that video on social media and with elementary schools. And now I'll pass it on to Caitlin who will talk about universal design. So also as part of our design process, we implemented several features that would contribute to a more accessible product overall. We decided to make use of this dyslexia friendly font, which makes it a lot easier for our dyslexic readers by using heavier bases to ground the letters so that they don't flip around while they're reading. And the letters also have unique shapes to discourage swapping and reversal. And the larger characters make it so they won't crowd together. And we also kept the same considerations for our visual designs as well by accommodating those with heightened sensory stimulation by using neutral toned and lower intensity colors. And the same goes for formatting where we try to incorporate properties of visual hierarchies wherever we could so that book is not only visually pleasing, but also very easy to navigate. And so next up, I'll be handing it over to Rahul to give you guys a rundown of Arlo and Papa. After compiling our design ideas and testing our prototype, our final story ended up being a 24 page picture storybook that follows Arlo, a neurodivergent girl with dyspraxia in her first day of school. She endures hardships like failing to write her name and classmates making fun of her during playtime. With the support of her father, she comes to the realization that she deserves to be loved and appreciated as much as any other child in the world. So our children's book is targeted at children who are elementary school aged, which is why we believe that it would be a great idea to reach out to our neighboring elementary schools. We wrote emails to elementary schools in Torrance, Torrance Unified School District, and we pitched Arlo and Papa to them. We got some wonderful replies. One principal even suggested that we film ourselves reading our books so that their students can hear us read it. Finally, for our elementary school integration, we created discussion questions and activities to provoke thought and leave an impact on those who read Arlo and Papa. If you would like to check that out, it's in our card link. And now I'll hand it off to Saisha. OK, so here's just a snippet of the video that we created to send out to schools. This is just a few snippets of the video. And the full video will be available on our card. Arlo and Papa, a tale of embracing neurodiversity. Arlo wakes up, bumps her head. She brushes her teeth and makes her bed. At snack, Arlo is feeling down, for the kids said she could be a clown. Papa picks up Arlo, three o'clock. When he arrives, she's not hard to spot. Arlo smiles back at Papa in the mirror and thinks to herself that there is no fear in wanting to be included and loved, only if it is without being judged. And thank you for that amazing video. We made an Instagram account for people to follow our progress and learn more about our goals. Through this, we have been able to reach hundreds of people and connect with other neurodiversity advocates. Feel free to follow us at Neurodiversity Writers, which will be sent out in our card link. And next, Tiana will be talking about our website. Yeah, so we also have a website for Arlo and Papa. This website will be home to our future projects that we will work on to continue advocating for more diverse representation of neurodiversity in the media. It will also help document our journey with making our communities more educated on neurodiversity from a young age. Be sure to bookmark our website to stay up to date with us. Our contact information is also in there, so make sure to check that out if you have any questions. And you can find the link in our card. And now I'll hand it off to Yisha. So now I'm just gonna give some more information about what we have in store and our exciting plans for the future. So we're currently working with other members of SMP Reach to translate Arlo and Poppet into French. And we hope to translate it to more languages in the future to increase accessibility. And lastly, as I mentioned earlier, we are planning on writing future children's books focused on embracing neurodiversity. So we'd really appreciate any feedback that you all have on Arlo and Papa that we could incorporate into our future books. Next, I'll be passing it on to Rahul, who will be talking more about broadening accessibility. So right now, we have three plans for increasing accessibility. First, we plan to translate into different languages. 
we believe that translations into foreign languages like French, Spanish, etc., um, will bring the concept of neurodiversity to people all around the world that might be unfamiliar with the concept right now. Second is increasing local accessibility. We plan to make physical copies of the book so we can donate them to local libraries and elementary schools so students can learn about neurodiversity from a young age, as well as opportunities for read aloud. Three is audiobooks. Um, like ebooks, they would make our story widely accessible by anyone with access to the internet. And that allows those who might prefer auditory listening over visual ones to still learn about Arlo and Papa. And now we would like to introduce our second book, Oliver and Friends, which follows a young boy with dyslexia on his first day of school and how his supportive peers make school a more welcoming learning environment. And now Christine will be reading a few excerpts from our new book. Oliver Fox got up from bed. He changed his clothes and ate some bread. He went to school on a yellow bus and walked up the stairs with great disgust. All of a sudden, a kind voice said, I want to read for Oliver instead. Oliver sighed with a great relief and felt a smile creep from cheek to cheek. He finished his reading with a smile on his face while the room rang with applause from his classmates. Now he realized that school was good because he made friends who understood. We hope you enjoyed the excerpt of our upcoming book. So next, I'll talk about our projected timeline for the rest of this year, which has our main focuses revolving around integrating Arlo and Papa into elementary schools and also completing and publishing Oliver and Friends. So our projected dates are as listed on the screen. The video will be shown in schools in the Torrance Unified District by November 15th. Our Oliver and Friends rough draft will be finished by the end of November and the finalized version will be published as an Amazon ebook by the end of the year. And the few of the other smaller scale projects we've decided to take on, such as printing physical copies, progressing into audiobooks and translations will be in motion as well, albeit prematurely as of this year. But even beyond those, we have a lot of things planned for 2022. So please look forward to our future projects. And thank you so much for listening to our presentation. And we will now be taking any questions. We also have an anonymous question, feedback, and commentary form, which will be sent in the chat now. All right, thank you so much, uh, the Arlo and Papa group, for that wonderful presentation. If there are any questions, please put them in the Q&A right now. And so far, I've seen some commentary that just says that it's a wonderful presentation from the SP Reach group. All right, for the sake of time, we'll move on to the next presentation for now, but feel free to email or send the group members any questions that you have after the session, and they will try to answer them. Or you can also email neurodiversity nia at stanford.edu and contact us there, and then we'll pass on any questions to the prospective groups. All right, so the next, next group is um, a group that has been working on integrating the concepts of neurodiversity, such as strength-based thinking into special education at school. So can we have the ISL group presentation take it away? All right, hello everyone. I hope you all have been enjoying the summit today. Um, my name is Sophie Moraghi and our group's project is Integrating Strength-Based Learning in Classrooms or ISL for short. So here's a quick overview of what exactly we will be discussing today. Our purpose, accommodations and activities and future plans are some of the big points we'll be covering. 
These topics are broken down further in the agenda you see on the screen right now. Thank you for the introduction, Sophia. And so to start off, the methodology behind our project was mostly cultivated through our understanding of what a fully embracive and inclusive classroom is, which we thought was not fully represented in the traditional definition of full inclusivity within the classroom. So according to the American Psychology Association, the practice of providing children with disability services in their home school and educating them in a regular classroom on a permanent full-time basis is seen as the epitome of fully inclusive classrooms, which we believe is not fully understandable due to the continuous emphasis on regularity and the lack of expression or reference to um, accommodations provided for those who might be in need of other methods to learn in the best way possible. And so the picture is also the um, example classroom from, the picture is an example classroom from one of the United States um, classrooms that we've taken a picture of. And it is a representation of the definition in itself as it can be seen that the lack of accommodations within placements are not fully embraceable all students. For example, the separated desks can be seen as discouraging for group work, yet the closeness of the seatings can also feel restrictive for some, along with the desk chair. The rigid and uncomfortable placements added on with the plastic covering can also feel uncomfortable and prevent focusing, especially for neurodiverse individuals. The lack of windows and the emptiness of walls, while helpful at exam points, in general during class time can also add on to the claustrophobic feeling and the loud noises caused by the chairs or lack of buffers due to the plastic coverage can also be problematic for the understanding or the learning process of those who might be sensitive to some of these cues that are auditory, sensory, or um, just overall visual. And therefore, to be able to accomplish a better and more inclusive and embracive classroom, we believe that both this traditional definition and its implementation within classrooms needs to be adjusted. And now Rashi will explain how our own approach was implemented within the project. So on the contrary to the traditional definition, our definition of full inclusion is to provide activities and accommodations so that both neurodivergent and neurotypical students can benefit and collaborate. It's imperative to notice here that through the traditional definition, students are not accommodated for in order to perform their best but rather put into a regular classroom that does not suit their needs. Our overall goal for this project is to build a more inclusive classroom. The first way that this will be done through is through physical accommodations, which allow students to stay more focused in class. By staying more focused in class and having a higher attention span, they'll be able to work on their strengths more rather than get disturbed by certain surroundings. The next part of this project to build a more inclusive classroom is to have personalized activities that cater to the strengths of each student. Doing so integrates a strength-based model, allowing the students to more efficiently understand the material and display understanding using their preferred method of learning. To integrate our model, we first need to create an environment where all students are accommodated for, which we will be talking about now. So this is our approach to our project. First, we're taking practical steps towards having and maintaining a strengths-based environment. We recognize funding needed for accommodations or other features and are working efficiently to make sure that high quality material is used while at the same time being cost effective. In order to comply with all school and program regulations over curriculum, we are not changing the school system, but rather augmenting it by giving additional activities and accommodations that schools and teachers can use to further help their students. Through implementation flexibility, we can selectively adapt our project and deliver a sustained impact at different types of schools and programs. We plan to have high scalability for this project, expanding past high schools through elementary and middle school institutions and in respective districts. Rather than starting with multiple schools at once, we are first starting with one school so that strengths-based learning can properly individually be established in each one. This is a continuous initiative, as rather than having a one-time performance, we observe and evaluate project to further scale it.
All right, so the two drawings on this slide are examples of our planned out ISL classroom floor plan after implementing our accommodations into classrooms. Accommodations are dynamic. So this means that whatever students need will be brought into classrooms to best suit their needs. We challenge the traditional definition of full inclusion, which expects all neurodiverse students to function to their fullest potential without any given accommodations. Um, still, the environment needs to change for students to succeed in a less restrictive class environment, and modern classrooms have many obstacles in the way of student learning. So while our ISL classroom hopes to introduce accommodations that will positively change the environment around students to help everyone learn in a better environment. Um, our ISL classroom accommodations follow a universal design, which means we target our accommodations to enhance every student's experience in class, not just neurodivergent students. And the accommodations are less restrictive and less restrictive learning environment will also increase student performance because we make the classroom more accommodating to everyone's needs. Next slide, please. So the previous slide targeted the general floor plan, but um, here's some work that's been started at my own school at Evergreen Valley High School. In the image to the left, you can see my current English classroom in which I worked with my teacher on creating a floor plan that would work well for all students. We implemented flexible seating to help with student engagement. Um, if you noticed, all seats are facing the front of the classroom as well. And we have sofas, swivel chairs, and more, just a huge variety. Um, we're currently working on student art and we took student advice that blank walls are better than walls with art during tests. So we're implementing dividers during testing for all students to have a clear space to work in. In the other image to the right, I implemented tennis balls under chairs in my physiology class, which reduced chair noises and helped students focus. This could not have been done without the donations of neighboring schools who helped supply us with the resources needed for our accommodations. Next slide, please. So I'm now working with the school principal, the special education department and inclusion support specialist in implementing school-wide neurodiversity trainings with a professor from Virginia Commonwealth University. We're still looking for educators who would be willing to help us with this task at our high schools. I, I began my advocacy for neurodiversity after seeing students at school who were being treated differently for their differences. And through education, we all hope to remove any negative stigmas around students who are neurodivergent. We've started to collect data on classroom accommodations that students, guardians, teachers would like to see in classes and brought those changes into our classrooms at EV. With the data we've collected, you can see in this one that almost 20% of students don't feel comfortable in their current environment. And we hope to bring those numbers down with our work. Next slide, please. So here's another chart. Um, it shows that only 9.7% of students feel that their teachers are fully accommodating in their classrooms. And we also hope to bring this percentage up. Next slide. So we found that we can create accommodations that we know our audience needs and wants to be implemented through our surveys. With the feedback, we can make sure we make a positive impact. And a few students talked about the dyslexia friendly font on the form, which we're actually using for this presentation today. Without the feedback, we wouldn't have known about this accommodation. And at the bottom, we also have an accommodation survey, which we hope you all can take some time to fill out at the end of our presentation. So taking inspiration from Rayon's classroom design, I started to implement changes in my own classroom at Ecole des Pionniers in Canada. We moved single rows into more open seating plan that is better for promoting group work. This seating plan has all students facing the front of the class. However, there is still very little mobility. The next step would be to create three levels to the classroom when it comes to seating and having isolated plain walls for students to use at their choice. Some high chairs have been donated for free and we will start bringing them into the classroom along with high desks made by, desi by the design class. The second component of our project is creating accommodated activities. These activities give learning a purpose, which can at times help neurodiverse individuals learn better. These activities consider the mode of learning and expression of this learning, as all students learn in a different way. The activities are student-led, promoting collaboration between neurodiverse and neurotypical students. And these activities are strengthened by the classroom accommodations that create an accessible physical setting made on universal design. 
giving students a chance to learn, chance to learn in a more positive manner. One of the activities implemented at École des Pionniers is providing special education teachers with material tech libraries across Canada. For example, the Miriam Foundation and Aid Canada. According to the Miriam Foundation, material tech are items specifically created and purchased to educate, rehabilitate, and enrich the lives of individuals with de development disabilities. The goal of these activities is to provide resources to children at a young age so they can learn in a fun way. Yeah, so I want to give a, a quick illustration of what those activities look like in a digital format. Um, so the first example of that would be, um, I worked with a student that has autism a few months ago. Um, students with autism are, they tend to be uh, very good at being detail oriented and diligent at certain tasks, but need a little bit more help adapting to different scenarios and being more flexible in that regard. Uh, so we tailored to the, both those um, strengths and weaknesses in order to create video curriculum. We essentially created short uh, pieces that we'd ask personal information about the student, um, just a few seconds long. And we had different virtual backgrounds. So they get used to different environments to answer these questions in. And we had multiple people doing them besides just myself uh, in order to get them used to um, answering questions in different settings to different people uh, while still uh, strengthening their ability that they already have of being diligent because it's a recording. They can go back to it anytime they want. A similar idea applied to uh, the games that we have on the right side of the screen. Um, the key idea behind this is UDL, Universal Design for Learning, um, which is really accommodating for students' different learning styles. Uh, we have the physical dimension to universal design being in the accommodations that we have, uh, but also uh, you know, the more cognitive dimension, the way that we uh, present games and um, providing multi-sensory engagement, as Chloe talked about in her last slide, um, and having agency over the way curriculum is learned so you can choose your own activities uh, in these settings. And then you could choose how you express your knowledge of those activities instead of being confined to um, just one test. Um, this also really promotes the idea that we have a full inclusion, right? Not just putting a bunch of students neurodivergent, neurotypical into a rigid, regular classroom, but um, accommodating for their differences um, and really bring them to together to collaborate in smaller settings uh, so they really get to know each other. That's really the purpose um, of the project here to uh, for students to get to know each other. And that could combat stigmas that can promote uh, real community service. Uh, so the example I have on the slide um, is a student in our, uh, in our special education program who's really passionate about music making. Um, so we made an activity for them uh, to tailor to that interest, um, hoping to uh, teach them more about their interests, but also about uh, overall just how to play games online and how to you know, um, use virtual activities. So at my school that I attend currently, Miraloma High School, I founded and currently run the Neurodiversity Club. My club has a few key uh, has a few key goals that we as a group keep in mind. So the very first thing that I sought to do in creating this club was to create the tutoring program. So in this, neurodiverse students within Miraloma can come to a classroom during lunch or after school and receive tutoring spanning across various subjects. The difference from normal peer tutoring is that the Miraloma Neurodiversity Club tutoring experience lets neurodiverse individuals learn based on their individual strengths. Our club also hosts keynote speakers to spread awareness about neurodiversity and educate neurotypical individuals. These topics usually include experiences, advice, and updates. In regards to updates, our club is also working on a website to post updates surrounding neurodiversity at Miraloma, and we also hold presentations to educate neurotypical students who seek to learn more about neurodiversity and how it shapes Miraloma. So this all ties into Bridge to Learning, which I founded and created, uh, shown in the picture on the right, that offers free tutoring for neurodiverse students. Uh, unlike the tutoring program at school, this one is international, meaning we seek to expand globally, since, since neurodiversity is most definitely not just present in one area. So when a student uses Bridge to Learning, they can state their learning preferences, also their dislikes of types of learning, so that a unique tutoring experience can be crafted for each student. So right now, the plan that I am implementing in my school is integrating strength-based assessments. These are surveys that ask students in special education classrooms what their preferred learning styles are. And after the data is collected and analyzed, activities are distributed throughout classrooms according to the student preferences. Uh, these activities are supplemental lessons to the school curriculum, as well as additional concept practice. And this has really helped shaping where our project is going.
And so on a more administration-based level, I have had the opportunity to represent our project at my own school district, Irvine Unified School District, and at its Continuous Improvement Council and Student Advisory Council as well, where I had the opportunity to work on curriculum alongside my principals, administrators, and any kind of educational caregiver at my district. And the idea behind the plan and for this curriculum development was initially implementing social justice standards within the system, which have four domains, identity, diversity, justice, and action, with the focus mostly being on race and ethnicity. Yet the necessity to stop any form of outside discouragement that can be problematic for all students learning has caused its target demography to now be more inclusive. And therefore I had the chance to represent neurodiversity as well. And I had the chance to also ask for more proper representation for its inclusion and for the implementation of strength-based learning and UDL projects for the curriculum that has been recently developed with some of my inclusions, including real life scenarios that can be helpful for tackling on um, more abstract concepts that can be hard to grasp for some people alongside the inclusion of visual sensory and auditory support and mechanisms that can help it clear for those who prefer a different method for learning and alongside with all the physical accommodations that have been discussed by the previous speakers. And as this model will be looking for different for each school based on its necessities, the main curriculum development has been mostly on just identifying the need to work on which places can be improved and therefore cultivating a simple draft that can be then adjusted based on the school needs and then cultivating again activities that can be utilized by different teachers with what they see most fit for their own target students and how they can be best implemented at their own school. But the main idea was to just have a curriculum that really specifically identifies the targets that need to be done and branched upon from. All right, so we've made the effort to collaborate with other groups from our 2021 SMP Reach cohort. Uh, for example, we were featured on Group F's podcast, and I created an ad for Group F to post on their Instagram so that they could discuss our progress and expand the scope of our project through social media. We are also currently working with Group D to translate their book into languages such as French, Turkish, and Spanish so that it can reach a wider audience and be taught in more classrooms. Ultimately, our goal for the future is to continue to extend the scope of our project so that it can reach and positively impact as many people as possible. We aim to do this by training teachers and students so that our project can be correctly replicated in different settings, such as in elementary schools and middle schools. Things like implementing freshman senior buddy programs to help neurodiverse individuals with the transition to high school and holding a neurodiversity celebration week at our respective schools are also some of our plans for the future. And like I mentioned before, we plan to continue collaborating with other groups, as I mentioned earlier, for example, translating Group D's book into other languages. Yeah, so um, our message in conclusion is, you know, coming up on the end of the summit, uh, I think it's important for everyone to kind of reflect on their own personal connections um, to the concept and to the movement at large of neurodiversity itself. Um, whether that's something that you learned about through a friend, a colleague, um, whether you yourself identify as neurodivergent or whether you just saw a post on social media or you first learned about it through this summit. Um, when you think about that personal connection, we think that can translate a lot to um, practicality as odd as that might be. Um, you know, we're students, we're high school students. Um, so obviously, so the practical focus of our project um, is on, uh, you know, making changes at the school level. Uh, first at the high school level, then eventually, um, you know, to middle school and elementary school where we first started. Um, and we're all individuals in this group. So the project that we have has been, you know, realized and actualized in different ways um, at our different schools. Um, but we still operate with that same backbone, you know, that same DNA of ISL, of integrating strength-based learning. Uh, so we hope that you can, you know, take all the information that you've learned from our presentation, the other presentations, and really all the insight that you've gained from the summit um, in order to start to build some kind of change um, in what your community is, however you define your community um, in relation to neurodiversity, that's what we hope that we can spark in you as well, whether that's the same focus as us um, with accommodations or activities um, or, you know, education outreach and school settings, uh, or whether that's something completely different, right? Neurodiversity is kind of broadly defined, 
uh, for good reason, because there's so many ways it could go and there's so many lives that it could touch. So we hope that this gives you enough information, enough insight, um, enough, uh, you know, motivation to kind of uh, bring about those changes um, in your own communities. So with that, we'd like to thank you for attending. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, we could take some of those now. Um, and we also have a survey that Rayan mentioned earlier about some accommodations that uh, you might be interested in seeing in your own settings, uh, whether you're in a school or professional. Uh, we'd like to hear your input about those. Uh, so please, you know, scan the QR code um, to let us know your thoughts. And before we transition, I'm going to go ahead and drop a link into chat for a link to the survey as well, because if you guys aren't able to scan the QR code for some reason, that's another way you guys can go ahead and access the form. All right, thank you so much to our wonderful ISL group for this presentation. And we will now transition to our next group. We have been working on a project on creating social media platforms through Instagram, Discord, podcasts, and more to encourage neurodiversity advocacy. Yeah, feel free to take it away. Thank you. And I think that uh, the other group has to stop sharing for us to start sharing. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. We are Stand for Neurodiversity, an inclusive social media platform made by and for neurodivergent and neurotypical teens. My name is Ben, and I work with Megana and Joshua to raise awareness about neurodiversity through our online presences. So hi, everyone. My name is Megana. I'm a sophomore at Troy High School in LA, California. Hi, my name is Ben. I am a senior at Campbell High School in Smyrna, Georgia. Hi, I'm Joshua, and I'm a freshman at Palo Alto High School in California. And we would love to give a huge thanks to the SNP Beach program, who played a huge role in jumpstarting this new passion and giving us an opportunity to start this work in advocacy. A huge shout out to all the speakers and members of the program who helped inspire ideas and teach us new things every day. And of course, thank you for all the people who support our social media. We truly appreciate it as you help us spread the cause we work for. A quick recap of why we chose social media. Social media is by far one of the most vast and powerful platforms we have to date, especially amongst the young and upcoming generations. When we talk about something like neurodiversity, we want to inform, persuade, and educate supporters on how they can make a difference. With our, Insta with our Instagram account, Discord server, podcast, and TikTok, we are able to achieve this high standard of neurodiversity advocacy success. It is a primary form of communication amongst our generation, which can reach millions of people with the click of a button. So the most prominent movements in our generation have sprung from social media. A couple examples being BLM, hashtag Me Too, March for Our Lives, and many more. These movements have captured global attention through social media and online campaigns. Social media is a powerful way of reaching people because no movement can work if no one listens. We can keep talking about the importance of neurodiversity awareness, but if it captures no one's attention, there is nothing we can do. Social media allows for likes, comments, stories, and messages, which enables us to interact with our followers and supporters. The mutual interaction allows people to care about our account and focus on the advocacy we do. Our generation has already demonstrated that social media is a vital form of communication. We started with our Instagram account to first develop, develop a brand. If you scan the QR code on the side, you can view our current progress in our posts. Our primary aim for developing an account was to spread awareness on our diversity and build safe and friendly communities. We did this by constructing various information posters, which depict the various attributes throughout the spectrum. With Instagram, we utilized their insights feature to track our growth and development with empirical data. So far, we have grown over 850 followers. The statistics are based on the past month. So as you can see, we have grown exponentially in outreach. One of the statistics I'm most fascinated about is our outreach internationally, with about 50% of our followers coming from countries like the UK, Canada, Australia, and India. Also, our Instagram account has reached all ages from 13 to 65 plus. 
Now we will take an in-depth look at our current Instagram post. Through SMP Reach, we utilize the design process to further our infographics. The left post on autism was our first prototype, which was considered too formal, so we dialed it back with our ADHD awareness post in the middle. However, through the valuable feedback from the SMP cohort, we found that it was too muddled and may seem overstimulating. Finally, after SMP Reach, we developed our dyslexia post, which utilized fewer words and more images, which made it more accessible to those with impaired vision. Also, our implementation of descriptions appealed to universal design. All in all, feedback has been a crucial aspect of our project and a continuous component towards our growth and development of future posts. To continue our posts, uh, we created eye-catching animations. Our posts are now more visually stimulating. We also understand that our target audience are youths and teens as they currently have the most impact in online presence. We hope by continuously spreading information and appealing to the younger generation, we can effectively promote a neurodiverse community. Here is a different category of posts we do. We love to promote others' neurodiversity advocacy work, such as the integrated strength-based learning project who had just spoken, shown in the blue post at the bottom. This is where we promoted their amazing efforts. And speaking of the SNP projects, the post at the top right is where we wrote about all the projects in the SNP REACH program and all of their work. We also put an influential quote by Harvey Bloom to promote powerful messages to all of our followers, shown at the yellow post at the top. This is an example of how we share messages in a meaningful manner. At our SNP REACH program, Sienna Castellan, who attends Stanford University, spoke to us during our summer camp about all her work in neurodiversity. And we were greatly inspired by her and we did a podcast episode about her, which will be shared later in the presentation. And with the conversations we had there, we made an Instagram post for her, which is at the bottom left. We put some of her influential stories and inspiring quotes she had mentioned and compacted it into a post at the bottom left for user interaction. Not only is social media extremely helpful in spreading advocacy messages, we are also able to advertise and promote other messages and platforms. For example, when we launched our podcast, we were able to inform our followers and quickly gain the attention of the right audience. We also started a Discord server and TikTok, which we promoted on our Instagram as means of developing a community. We hope in the future we can also promote other organizations and groups here today on various platforms. If you know a project that you think would be good to share with the public, or if you would like to be featured on a podcast or post, you're welcome to contact us on Instagram or any platforms available in chat. Another main form of communication we've utilized to interact with users are Instagram stories. Instagram stories are vertical photos or videos up to 15 seconds that disappear after 24 hours after posting, unless highlighted. The circles in the red box are highlights of our stories. They are key stories we saved on our page and are sorted into three categories, our community, our posts, and questions. For our questions, we specifically use those to interact with others, as you see on the left. This is impactful because we can continue our journey with getting people involved in neurodiversity advocacy by engaging them with questions. Another one of our highlights is our posts, where we promote our infographics and inform others looking through their feed. It is also useful for supporters to quickly share it to, other, to their own stories, thus creating a chain effect and spreading the information faster into a broader audience. This feature on Instagram allows you to slide an emoji slider depending on how you feel that day. It helps us connect with our audience and we sometimes privately DM people who give us a low rating for how they feel. We also spread positive messages through these stories. So when followers are scrolling through stories and come across these positive messages, it can brighten up a follower's mood, which is what we aim to do with our account. We know there is a lot of writing on this slide and you definitely do not have to read all of it. It is just to give you an idea of what the community reaction looks like. Here are some private messages we get regarding our account. We have lots of supporters who are neurodiverse and have opened up about their positive thoughts on our posts. They have also told us that they can relate to our posts and how they have, how they now feel accommodated with our posts. The input we receive from all of our supporters and followers is extremely helpful in determining what we can do to spread the best efforts in neurodiversity. Social media allows for an inclusive and collaborative unity against negative stigma shrouding neurodiversity. So you guys can have a second to read through these messages.
An important thing we did with our account was partnering with other companies and nonprofits outside of SP. So far, we have collaborated with Atarxia, a popular neurodiversity nonprofit. We have some exciting projects coming up with that nonprofit in the future. We have also received positive messages from a nationally recognized organization called I2I National, in which they committed our efforts to advocate for neurodiversity and offered to share our post. Another exciting opportunity occurring in a few weeks is our collaboration with a public gift in which we help use clothing and jewelry to spread neurodiversity awareness. An example of their merchandise sold is shown on the slide and the revenue is donated toward charitable causes. With our podcasts and posts, these organizations realize that the causes we support can be combined for a greater impact. Welcome to In Another's View, a podcast series to engage the community to stand for neurodiversity through the lens of view. You've just heard the intro to our podcast, but what is it? Our podcast named In Another's View is published on Apple and Spotify. We use podcasts for the following benefits. Number one, it directly accesses our audience worldwide. They can listen anywhere, anytime. Number two, it offers privacy for our guests, especially for people who might not want to show their face. In private settings, the guests feel comfortable and will reveal more insight. We invite a wide range of guests from different perspectives. We share our episode through the lens of youth, as we believe the change needs to start from the youth that ripples through their family, friends, and community. And in our pilot launch period, we've launched a trailer in four episodes, interviewing neurodivergent and neurotypical youth, and a founder of a very special coffee house that employs neurodivergent young adults. We create very touching titles, such as Growing Up Awesome and Autistic, Stand Your Ground, Be Different, Think Different, and A Little Compassion. So now let's hear a short, simple soundbite. First, let's hear from a neurotypical youth, a ne sorry, neurodivergent youth, Sienna. How can they turn their negative experiences into something so powerful? I guess not to focus on them and not to kind of stay in the past and, and just constantly kind of dwell on the challenges that you had and the way people responded to them. And I know that that's something that's very easy to say, but it's something that is important to do because there was a time in my life where I was very much focused on all of the negative things that teachers said to me. But what has, has been the time I've spent developing the positives from my neurodivergence to be doing things that you enjoy and doing things that you're good at instead of working on challenges that can be very demoralizing when you don't see progress. The next sample soundbite is with the founder of a special coffee house that employs neurodivergent young adults. You'll hear how they use creativity during the so pandemic. So we really, again, try to meet them where they are. But the biggest, I think, pivot that we made was we always sold Nest hats and t-shirts and things like that. And a number of our young adults who were creative um, also had stuff that we sold of theirs, just a few things. And I was like, oh my gosh, why don't we just have more of that? Why don't we encourage all of our young adults you know, to use their creative abilities and come up with something that we'll put in the shop and they'll do it on consignment and they can be seen and valued for all their creativity. And we filled the entire shop, all of our seating area became a boutique. And we called it the Possibilities Boutique. The last clip is a poem made by their neurodivergent artist. <laughs> that poem and what it says, would you like me to read it to you? Oh, sure. So it's called The Nest. And it says, fly high, my friends, against the currents of stigma and rejection. Sing your song to the world. Show them all that you can soar. Take care and you'll find it, a place to land, a place to flourish and envelop yourself in love. Bask in the warmth of a cup of tea served with sugar and smiles and laughter that for the first time is not at your expense. You belong. So in another's view, start with your view. Call to action, everyone. Please take out your phone and go to Apple or Spotify to find in another's view and have a listen. We hope that your heart will be warmed as much as ours were after you listen to our latest episodes. And we would also love if you referred guests to us. One day we hope that nobody will be afraid of revealing their neurodiversity identity or standing up to advocate for themselves. That one day we will all be embracing and celebrating each and everyone's unique strengths.
Please let us know if you have any questions. And also, if you would like, you can contact us through our Instagram account or email at stanfordneurodiversity at gmail.com. All of our platforms are shared in chat. And if you support this clause, please follow our Instagram at Stanford Neurodiversity. Thank you to everyone for listening to our presentation. We really appreciate everyone coming today to support such an effort. We would also like to extend a huge thank you to our 850 plus followers who have helped spread this positivity and message. We will now be open to questions via the Q&A feature. All right, thank you all so much for your amazing presentations. In the interest of time, we'll move on to conclude this session, but it was wonderful to hear about the exciting updates that these groups have achieved in such a short amount of time. If you're interested in reaching out to these groups, feel free to email them with the contact information they provided or email neurodiversity nia at stanford.edu and we will pass on any questions. If you're interested in applying to SMP Reach and engaging in exciting projects like the ones that were shared today, or if you're interested in joining NIA's mailing list to be notified of our meetings and initiatives, please refer to the chat for links to respective websites. Please stay tuned for our summit's concluding session, and I'll pass it back over to Dr. Fung.